Okay, welcome. Um, the last lecture focused on um, finishing up talking about the first part of the first process involved in making urine. Um, and that's the filtration process where the glomerulus filters the blood, um, creates the filtrate, which is very similar in composition to blood plasma, sands the plasma proteins. Um, but before we actually can call it urine, um, we go through the other two processes, and that's reabsorption and secretion, which is done by the renal tubules. Um, it is... Um, mostly a, a, um, an active transport process. There is some passive transport as well. Um, and um, again, your kidneys produce about 180 liters of fluid um, in terms of filtrate, but you actually only secrete or ex excrete, excuse me, um, about a liter and a half of urine. Um, and so just about everything is getting um, reabsorbed. Um, by the tubules, um, particularly uh, the proximal convoluted tubule, um, because again, it has these little microvilli um, that create a lot of surface area for um, carrier proteins and whatnot. Um, it is a selective process. Um, some stuff isn't reabsorbed, some stuff is. Um, pretty much anything that is useful to your body so all of your organic nutrients all of your amino acids your sugars your fatty acids um, anything that your body can use will get reabsorbed um, by the renal tubules um, all of the other stuff the ions water it's all kind of hey if we need it we reabsorb it if we don't need it we get rid of it um, and just let it stay in the filtrate um, and, and so um, it really is just about a matter of um, kind of what your body needs at any given time. Um, there are kind of two routes of transport through the membrane. Um, there's what we call the transcellular route where um, something will have to be reabsorbed um, by typically some sort of carrier protein or channel um, in the membrane and then crosses uh, across the whole cell um, and then into the interstitial spaces and then eventually into the peritubular capillaries surrounding the tubules. It can also be, um, or travel shall we say, um, via a paracellular route um, and that basically means it can go between two cells of the tubules. Um, typically that's going to be something that's going to be small enough that can fit through those cells. Um, so um, anything that can kind of leak through the cells. Um, uh, the reabsorption of sodium um, is really, really important in terms of um, getting nutrients, water, and other ions in um, because sodium gets absorbed uh, excuse me, reabsorbed um, by what we call primary active transport. There is a carrier protein um, that is pumping sodium against its concentration gradient to reabsorb it out of the filtrate and back into the cells, across the cells, and into the blood. Um, that creates that gradient of high sodium here, low sodium here, um, and that gradient is also a form of potential energy. And so um, many other solutes like glucose um, kind of get co-transported um, in a process we call secondary active transport, um, kind of hijacking along with the sodium. Um, anything big like amino acids or some of the big proteinaceous vitamins and um, big clunky sugars um, will do so. Um, that kind of influx of sodium um, and other ions of that nature then creates an osmotic gradient for the water and so then the water follows the sodium to the higher sodium concentration 
um, and that gets reabsorbed via osmosis, typically through aquaporins, essentially literal water pores. Um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, um, aquaporins are always present. It's what we call obligatory water reabsorption. Um, if the sodium gets reabsorbed, water gets reabsorbed with it. Um, but we can also get aquaporins um, that can get added to the collecting ducts when the collecting ducts are stimulated by ADH. And that's what we call facultative water reabsorption. Um, facultative meaning it doesn't always happen, but can happen um, if ADH stimulates the collecting ducts. Um, so let's look at this primary and secondary active transport. Um, so here is our primary active transporter. Um, it's our sodium potassium pump. We're on the surface of the cells closer to the the blood capillaries, so what we call the basolateral surface, um, and sodium gets pumped out of the cell of the proximal convoluted tubule into the interstitial fluid and um, kind of just gets absorbed then into the blood. Well, that creates this gradient such that this concentration of sodium is always kind of moving in this direction. Um, and so since we're always kind of getting the sodium here out of the cell and into here, it creates this gradient of sodium here where the sodium concentration is higher here and lower here because we're losing it via this active transporter. And so then sodium flows downhill, diffuses down its concentration gradient out of the filtrate and back into the cell. Well, um, other organic ions and glucose and sugars and vitamins, things like that, um, they kind of hijack along with it, where typically we're going to have pretty high concentrations of those things in our cells, um, but they can still go in um, because of this gradient that we made with the sodium. Um, so primary active transporter creates the gradient for sodium, the ions and glucose and big amino acids um, kind of co-transport by using that gradient that we made with the sodium. We can also look at the water reabsorption. We can have the aquaporins right in the um, walls of the proximal convoluted tubule. Water just moves right through it, across the cells, into the interstitial spaces, and into the blood. Anything, of course, that is lipid soluble can um, be absorbed, um, reabsorbed by the cells um, directly through the membrane, because the membranes themselves are plasma, um, not plasma, phospholipids, um, and some ions, um, urea, um, which is a, a nitrogenous waste. Um, it's actually small enough to go that paracellular route and actually fit um, through the, the junctions here. They are tight junctions, but they're kind of leaky tight junctions. Um, and so stuff can kind of fit in between the cells. Um, and that's all the ways that we reabsorb stuff. Um, most reabsorption, again, is done by the proximal convoluted tubule because it does have all those microvilli, which creates more surface area for these kinds of carrier proteins. Um, because the transcellular mechanisms of reabsorption um, use carrier proteins, um, we only have so many carrier proteins, um, and so we only have a, a, a kind of a limited number, and it's what we call a transport maximum. Um, everything that gets reabsorbed by the renal tubules has a transport maximum. And it really just is a matter of how many carrier proteins are available. Um, if we have, um, say, 20 molecules of glucose and we only have 10 um, carriers for glucose, then some of it's not going to get reabsorbed. Um, and that's exactly why urine shows up in people who have hyperglycemia, or why sugar shows up in people who have hyperglycemia, um, because their blood sugar levels are really, really high, and that even though the body would normally reabsorb as much glucose as it possibly can, um, there's too much glucose for it all to be reabsorbed, and so it shows up in your urine. Um, in terms of 
um, the rest of the renal tubules. Um, if we look at um, the distal convoluted tubule, um, you'll see um, it, it really is very, very, very variable. Um, same thing with the proximal convoluted tubule too. Um, all of the reabsorption and secretion is, is completely based on what your body needs. Um, water, sugars, anything organic, nutrient-wise will almost always get reabsorbed. Um, anything that got secreted um, is stuff typically that um, was too big to be filtered out but also needs to be gotten rid of. Um, so things like creatinine, um, urea, uric acid, because some of that stuff gets passively reabsorbed um, because it exists, because it can slip between those cells, but we don't really want it. Um, so that has to get kind of secreted back. Um, so, so urea is kind of a weird thing because it gets filtered into the filtrate, gets reabsorbed through the paracellular route, but then gets actively secreted um, because it's not something that's just a, it's, that we need. It's just a waste product. Um, so it's kind of a weird little funky thing. Um, if we look at um, what gets reabsorbed, again, water, ions, nutrients, um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, um, anything um, that's like some sort of medication that might get uh, secreted, maybe we're doing some acid-base balance and we have to get rid of some um, hydrogen ions that might get secreted. Um, secreted secretion of um, potassium ions um, when the distal convoluted tubule um, is stimulated by aldosterone, more um, potassium gets sec secreted into the urine. Um, water, chlorine, um, and the collecting ducts, um, it's affected by ADH, by aldosterone, um, so really anything um, that your body can use, um, it will reabsorb if it initially was filtered, um, anything that your body can't use or has an excess of, um, then um, it, it will get rid of. Um, and, and it's, it's really um, kind of just that simple. Um, what your body needs, it keeps. What, what it doesn't, it doesn't keep. Um, this is uh, table 25.1. Um, it looks at all the parts of the nephron. It's a really good kind of summary table um, listing um, kind of what gets um, reabsorbed and how it gets reabsorbed by the different parts of the um, renal tubules. Um, we're going to talk more about the, the nephron loop in a, a separate lecture here in just a second. Um, but there's our distal convoluted tubule and our collecting ducts. Um, so it's a really good um, table to look at in terms of just overall um, general function of the reabsorption that takes place by your renal tubules.